So today what I'll be talking about is the 10 dependent close coupling approach to electron scattering and with a little bit of <coughs> molecules thrown in. And this was work done uh, mostly at Auburn University with Mitch Benzola and myself now at Los Alamos. So I think I'll limit myself to discussion today of just electron impact ionization cross sections, uh, mainly because that's the uh, the main strength of the ten dependent close coupling method and what it can calculate, and, and I'll discuss why that is. We'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses of our method, what it can calculate really, really well, what uh, collision processes or uh, what systems it can't calculate perhaps as well, and we'll talk about some of the convergence issues that might lead to an uncertainty in the in the ten dependent close coupling calculation. And because I'll be doing a lot of comparison to distorted wave approaches, I'll just give a very brief uh, overview of what that actually means for electron impact ionization. And then I'd like to give an overview of some of the calculations that have been performed for ionization cross sections over the last decade or so, mostly with the examples being neutral atoms, ions, and one or two molecules. And I'll touch a little bit on electron impact excitation. There's less done in this area using time dependent close coupling, but we'll. Uh, show one or two examples perhaps. Now these data have been archived by Connor and Stuart in the, some of the public atomic databases, uh, sp specifically the ADAS database, but they're also I think available through uh, the AAEA website and other databases too, so I'll talk a little bit about that, how those may be accessed. And we'll talk about the outstanding issues that I see in the ionization, particularly using this TDCC approach what still needs to be done, and what can be done to estimate an uncertainty in terms of a path forward. So for those who aren't familiar with it, a time dependent close coupling approach centers around the solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation by straight numerical computation. And in this case, it's for two interacting electrons. So what one does is take the total wave function for two electrons, expand it over some spherical harmonic basis, and then straightforwardly propagate the, the radial wave function, this P function here, sorry I've lost my uh, pointer, but the PLS function uh, on some sort of numerical grid using finite difference, finite element, pick your favorite numer numerical method, and then do this until one reaches convergence with all respect to all the number of partial waves that you may have to include. The main strength of the process is that by doing this, the electron-electron interaction between the two outgoing electrons is treated exactly. Thank you. Yeah, it was working. I just touched it. It's not correct. <laughs> I'll just read my hands. There's a pointer right over there. There's a pointer right over there. It's actually a speaker, dude. Okay, I'll keep close to it. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> anyway, so the electron-electron interaction is treated exactly. So in the in a pure one-electron target, such as the atomic hydrogen, this should be uh, somewhat of a, an exact calculation within the numerics. Now, what one generally does is then, for electron impact ionization, is that you compute these, or you propagate these uh, <coughs> equations for all the LS terms that you might need to converge, and then monitor carefully the convergence with the number of states. After some high angular momentum terms, then this should hopefully converge and give you a, a scattering probability that can be uh, converted into a cross section. For multi electron targets, the interaction of the remaining electrons, the sort of frozen core or inert core, whatever you want to call it, is treated by us through direct and local exchange potential terms that are added to this uh, one electron potential term. And that's what's uh, used to mimic the interaction of the outgoing electrons with the core. So the main strength is the, is the interaction between the two outgoing electrons. So this process or this uh, procedure is going to be accurate for low energy 
systems for the two electrons spend a lot of time talking to each other as, as they type propagate out. And this is useful because it avoids the troublesome boundary condition associated with the three body Coulomb problem, the sort of classic uh, atomic collision problem found in electron impact ionization hydrogen and other systems too. One avoids the boundary condition by just time propagating the Schrodinger equation out until the interactions are hopefully small, and then one can uh, extract the probability by kind of standard projection techniques to get a total cross section out. And it's also nice that you can visualize the radial component of the wave function to see how the electrons start. Your initial wave function on the left hand side there is some sort of Gaussian pa wave packet uh, that, that <coughs> approaches the bound electron, and then as they uh, as they approach the nucleus, which is at the origin, the two wave packets interact, collide, and then propagate out in some complicated way. So you get probability distributions that look like this for a single partial wave, and of course you get this for all the partial waves that you need. And you may say, well, you need an awful lot of partial waves to converge, but at low or moderate energies, you really only need maybe a, a dozen or a few dozen partial waves so that one can converge these calculations, uh, at least with respect to that, quite straightforwardly. Now, what uncertainty issues then do we face? Uh, based on this morning's discussion, I, I kind of like the idea of separating the uncertainties into what I'm going to call numerical uncertainties and systematic uncertainties. Numerical issues are things that, as Tom said, pretty much everyone does, but perhaps doesn't talk about as much in their publications. You worry about things like the radial mesh chosen by your uh, calculation in terms of do you have a fine enough grid spacing, do you have a large enough box? the number of partial waves retained in the expansion, uh, not just the num total number of LS terms, but also in terms of the number of couple channels per, per total L term, whether top up with, cross, with distorted wave cross sections is used and at what partial wave these are applied. What that means is that in the early time dependent close copy calculations that we did, what we found was that the TDCC per partial wave cross section was uh, significantly different from the distorted wave for the low L's 0, 1, 2, 3. But once you get up to what I'm going to call higher L, 8, 9, 10, the distorted wave cross sections were in pretty good agreement. So recognizing that you may need to go to a very high L to save computer time in those early days, one topped up with distorted wave cross sections for some high L up to say from L equals 10 through 50 or something like that. With large computers, this is less of an issue these days, but uh, the older calculations, you might actually still consider that. An important one is also the choice of core potential that you might want to use for quasi uh, one or two electron calculations. Here I'm thinking of things like electron impact ionization of sodium or magnesium, where one has a frozen, uh, say, neonite core, and how do you represent that in terms of a, a spherical potential and how that may impact the uncertainty in your calculations. But an experienced user should be able to minimize these uncertainties, uh, although, as Connor has also pointed out, time-consuming testing is really the only way to really check these issues, and perhaps this is something that we should uh, discuss more in, in such publications. These are numerical issues, they're rather more what I would call physics-based issues. For systems that don't have a, a, or have a complicated structure, the interaction of the two active electrons with the remaining core electrons uh, can lead to uncertainty in the total cross-section because of the physics that we've used. And this is the physics of a time-dependent approach as a configuration average approach at its heart. And that means that the interaction of the core, the term dependence of the core with outgoing electrons is not properly included. And this can make a significant difference for uh, systems where you have a final core that's not spherical, that has a lot of term dependence, something like neon that we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. So a distorted wave approach is probably quite familiar to many people here, so I'll not dwell too much on it. But it's an approach that gets its name because the relevant wave functions, the incident scattered and ejected electrons, are all distorted by the potential that they see of the target atom. And one computes radial distorted waves using some sort of one electron Hamiltonian that I've written down here, very uh, schematically with some sort of direct and local exchange potentials perhaps as well. You do use those distorted waves to compute Slater integrals that are then converted into a scattering probability. Uh, you have a choice though of what you compute those radial orbitals in in terms of the potentials that they use. Uh, the incident and scattered electrons, you might think, well, they might see the potential of all the n target electrons, so a bn potential. Uh, 
and the eject electron might see a VN minus one potential because it's of course removed from the core. Although alternatives include computing all the orbitals in a VN minus one potential, and this is more attractive numerically because then all the uh, then all the we have functions of the same orthogonality properties, and it turns out that at high energies or for highly ionized targets, e either of these choices gives you pretty similar cross sections, but that's not necessarily the case for neutral or near neutral systems, as we'll see. And sometimes I they will use these perturbative methods. Uh, in the sense that the interaction between the electrons is not treated to all orders, unlike the close coupling methods, the TDCC or, or other close coupling methods. So let's look at some of the cross sections that have been done. One of the first TDCC calculations were made uh, by Mitch Benzola at Auburn for electron impact ionization of atomic hydrogen. Again, as I said, there's no issue about core potentials here. This should be, in, a, in principle, an exact calculation. and. Nicely enough, the total cross section represented by these squares agreed very well with the measurements from the Belfast group. Also, the conversion close coupling method from uh, Dima and Igor at about the same time were also in excellent agreement with these measurements. Now, the distorted wave approaches that I talked about, there's two flavors of them there, and they both are between 20 and 30 percent higher than the total cross section uh, measurement. And this is a sort of typical number that we see. The, the sort of wave calculations for ionization for neutrals are off usually about 20, 30 percent, depending on exactly the description. Now, since the total cross sections were computed, there's been a lot of effort in uh, actually measuring the angular distributions of the outgoing electrons and in computing the, uh, these differential cross sections. And those are interesting because they're, they're, they're a more uh, there are more. There are quantity that actually is a, a bigger test of your electron correlation. You're what, you're now not just considering the total ionization, but you're considering the ionization as a function of the ejected electron energy and what angles they come out. And so the interaction between the electrons is much more important. And so when you have agreement there, and th that does exist, although I'm not going to show it, between theory and experiment, it gives you good confidence that the three-body Coulomb problem is is pretty much solved, at least for atomic hydrogen. Now what about the excited states of hydrogen? Don Griffin, about almost 10 years ago now, led a study where he looked at, okay, the, the cross-section from the ground state, which is shown in this upper panel, but then also the total ionization cross-section from the excited states of hydrogen. This is the 2s, 3s, and 4s states. And there's a couple of things to note. One is that the distorted wave method, which was maybe 15, 20% off here in its, uh, for the ground state, gets progressively worse. It's almost a factor of two off or maybe even more for the excited states. And you may say, well, that's the excited states. Who cares about the 3s and 4s state of atomic hydrogen? But look at the cross sections. The cross section grows by between factors of five and 10 for these uh, excited states. So even if the population in those excited states may be small, the total cross section is so large that they may be actually quite important in collisional radiative modeling. And so the distorted wave approaches that you may say, well, I'll use them for excited states. They, the error may actually grow compared to the close coupling approaches. And I should point out that the close coupling approaches, in this case, there's three of them, I think, TDCC, convergent close coupling, and our matrix calculations from Connor, all agreed uh, quite well and with the experiments that were available for the 1S and 2S. So then you think about hydrogen-like systems, and Don's study went on to look at lithium-2+, so hydrogen-like lithium. Now in this case, the distorted we have one calculation, which is the mixed potential choice of Vn potential for the incident and scattered electrons, but Vn minus one for the ejected. It agreed very well with the experiment and with the close coupling approaches. The Vn minus one was a little bit off, but as you then looked at the excited states, the distorted we have one calculation was significantly off, especially for the more highly excited states. So even though the distorted we have approach may appear to be accurate for this. Uh, twice ionized ion for the ground state, that's not necessarily the case for the, for the excited states. So that was pretty instructive and uh, makes us worry about what we can use then in, in plasma modeling. So one can then, as we've done, look at the successively more complicated targets. Uh, for neutral helium, the TDCG calculations were also a good agreement with measurement. Again, to start, we have overestimated the total cross section by about 30%. And other calculations such as CCC have, have done a uh, a very accurate job for helium as well. There is a cautionary tale though for the excited state of helium. 
we did this calculation, I think, based on uh, Klaus's urging, where there was an, a measurement made in uh, 1970s from an Oxford group, which was the uh, blue dot or black dots there. And our time dependent calculation was given by this solid state line here from the, this is now from the 1S, 2S configuration of helium. Now, there's significantly di significant difference between the experiment and theory. There was also conversion post coupling calculations done by DEMA from the 1S, 2S singlet S and triplet S states. And they both disagreed strongly with the experiment and more worryingly, especially at the higher energies where you'd expect hopefully things that would be in good agreement. Klaus then came on the scene and did a, our matrix calculation at some point, I think uh, in the mid 2000s perhaps. And their cal his calculation, I think, is the upper line, and the converging close coupling calculation is the lower line here. This is just straight from his paper. And they're in reasonable agreement, let's say, but the experiment is now a factor of two higher than these. This is just the same data as I've shown here, but just on a different scale. And what's confusing was that the calculations that the, or the measurements that were shown in this paper. Uh, showed some claim we had born calculations that were done at the time that were actually in reasonable good agreement with the, with the measurement. And this seems to be a, an unfortunate coincidence that three close coupling methods predict an answer down here, but the measurement is up here with an inferior calculation, let's call it. So this is a, a plea that experiment we usually like to use as the ultimate arbiter for the theories, but in this case that's uh, perhaps not the case. So this is something that you would like to see re-measured. And it's not just the excited state of helium, ground state of lithium, the total cross section as well. Uh, the measurement seems questionable. Again, three close coupling methods came together TDCC and CCC from <coughs> Perth, and the R matrix calculations that were done by Connor. And at least two of them are in very good agreement here. I don't think I've shown the one of them, I think the R matrix calculation is on in this figure for some reason. But the measurements are consistently larger than the calculations, although they do agree with the sort of wave calculations, which is quite annoying, really. But again, this is a plea that measurements also should, be, should have to be looked at again. Uh, we can then march up the periodic table. I'm just going to skip over some of these. We looked at new, uh, the ground state of beryllium and beryllium from its excited state. There are no uh, experiments to compare with for beryllium, for neutral beryllium, but the two close coupling methods, time dependent on our matrix and CCC in the ground state, uh, are all in acceptable agreement. And perhaps one could imagine writing an error bar in these calculations by taking uh, the difference between these three close coupling methods uh, as the uncertainty in this sort of cross section and the absence of a measurement. For beryllium plus lithium, like again, again, these three. Uh, these three close coupling methods, RMPS, TDCC, and CCC, agree with each other, but the experiment is again consistently high. And so perhaps it is time to ask a group to remeasure the ionization for many of these light atomic systems. Whether that will happen or not is a, mm -hmm. a, an issue we'll come to later on. Uh, Brilliant 2 Plus will not dwell on because things are in looking pretty good shape. Even the sort of wave approaches appear reasonable for the ground state, but maybe overestimate a little bit the excited state ionization. Then you can look at boron. Boron was somewhat interesting in that the, the start of wave calculation that used the mixed potentials that I've seen, that seemed to do reasonably well for some of the ions. And this case seems to fail dramatically. You get this very prominent shape resonance in the, in the near threshold region that appears to be unphysical. This was discussed, I think, in some of the early distorted wave papers from Steve Younger in the 1980s. But it's not seen certainly in the close coupling calculations or in the distorted wave calculation with the Vn minus 1 potential used for all electrons. And I've neglected to point out so far that there is a, an empirical binary encounter scaling method due to Yonki Kim that, that usually does very well for these ground state total cross sections. And in this case, it agrees reasonably well with the 10 dependent calculation shown here. Boron plus, uh, this was a nicer system to compare with actually because recently Mike Fogel at Oak Ridge and now at Auburn uh, remeasured these calculations. He actually listened to some theorists and looked at the measurements again. These are older measurements from Gordon Dunn's group. Now, these measurements were a little bit unclear because there was a fraction of the metastable component, the 2S2P, triplet P component, but they had no way in those days of, com of uh, understanding what that component was. And it appears that the Earlier measurements had a, a large fraction of that component, 
and that's going to contaminate your total cross-section analysis because, as we've seen, the contribution from the excited state ionization cross-section can be sizable. So Mike Fogel was able to actually determine the metastable fraction of their beam at Oak Ridge. Uh, in this case, it, it was about 10%. And when you do the cal calculations for total ionization from the ground state of boron plus on then the excited state as well, put in the metastable fraction and compare that to the theory, you get an acceptable agreement between RMPS and TDCC that are within the bars of the measurement. I can then march up neutral carbon is uh, one of the earliest calculations you actually did. The storm of calculations are a little bit higher than the TDCC calculations. The excited carbon ions were more recently done. Uh, Connor led this effort and here there's what seems to be a large difference. This is the time-dependent close coupling results, which are smaller than the restored wave results by 20% or so on too. But this is the R matrix calculation, which is about a factor of two higher. And this is uh, not quite a, a disagreement, but what you're looking at here, this is the total direct ionization contribution. But the R matrix calculation, because it includes, in some sense, everything, has a very strong excitation auto ionization contribution arising from terms from this configuration. And that makes a very large contribution to the total cross-section. And the time-dependent calculations really only are uh, best suited for the direct contribution, whereas all these other terms come from the increased number of states in the arbitrary calculation. Carbon 2 plus was one of these other ions where there's a metastable component that's a, uh, that can be sizable. And in this case, another measurement was made at Oak Ridge where they measured the fraction in the in the, of the ion beam in the metastable state. In this case, it turned out to be about 60%. And when one plugs that in, that was the close coupling calculation. The close coupling calculations agree well with the, with the, with the measurements. I'll just skip over, I think, some of these oxygen ion ones to get to the neon one, because I think this is kind of instructive. So this is one of the earliest calculations I did at Auburn, where we looked at the total ionization cross-section of neon. The initial state was just a configuration average 2p, or one electron, I say the 2p5 core, and then the p electron couples with the incoming electron, to, and we probably get that for all the relevant terms. And what we found is, is that the total cross section was significantly larger than the measurement. Now, maybe this is an error in the measurement, but what we further checks in the using distorted wave calculations uh, were instructive in the sense that. We found that if you look at the term dependence of the ground state of neon, or I should say the excitation from the ground state of neon, the 2p6 to 2p5 KD is a very term dependent excitation. And in particular to the single p term, that excitation uh, is much is quite different from the configuration average excitation cross section. So it looks like the error in our configuration average time dependent calculation is due to our neglect of the term dependent interaction with the with the ground state. And so what we would like to do, be able to do is to include such r fock interactions in a time-dependent manner. And we haven't got there yet. But the, the, I should have pointed out that the distorted wave calculation is actually these dashed lines here that just fall into the error bars. So the configuration average distorted wave calculation is up there. The term dependent distorted wave calculation is down there. And it's agreement with the measurement may be a little bit uh, of a coincidence, but it shows that the term dependence does make a big difference. And this is one of the systematic uncertainties that I think uh, we have to worry about in our close coupling calculations. For excited state neon, Connor did a calculation some years ago where uh, with our, our, our matrix and also the, and then there was a follow-up time dependent calculation that did agree within the error bars of these measurements. Uh, I think Connor can correct me if I'm wrong, but these were the the two different error bars, I think, are from two different measurements, I think. Or, I think so, yeah. yeah, so the measurements all pretty much agree with each other, and the arm rate goes through the calculations and the time dependent agrees with it as well. To move up the periodic table just very quickly, these are distorted wave now calculations of the ground state of silicon, and the distorted wave overestimates the cross section in this case by quite a bit. 25. Okay, but for the half strip silicon distorted wave calculation goes right through the, the available measurements when you sum the contributions from the uh, two other subshells. And so this is one case where uh, you might think that distorted wave calculations uh, are acceptable to use once you get to be a half strip of the, of the relevant nuclear sequence. <coughs> 
And we've also finally done calculations on the cross sections of sodium and magnesium. What I show here are actually some of the angular distributions that I mentioned. And these are against measurements made by the Andrew Murray's group in Manchester. What this shows is that the total cross section, which is just one number that can then be sort of broken down into the triple differential cross sections as a function of the energy uh, sharing between the electrons and the angles at which they're ejected. And these things can be measured using coincidence techniques. And then the results from close coupling calculations usually agree quite well with these. So that's the level of agreement that one can expect from, uh, from these angular distributions. And though also this is not quite relevant to the modeling, but one can also do three electron calculations to look at double ionization processes. The reason I mentioned this is that there was a, a case in the literature where there was two measurements, an older one and a newer one from the Belgian group of the double ionization of the hydrogen negative ion. The measurements differ by about a factor of three from each other or more. And the time dependent calculation was able to decisively say, well, it's probably the newer measurement that's in, uh, that seems more accurate and that we agree with the calculation. So it is possible to do three electron calculation to look at total double ionization and possibly even ionization with excitation. And the final example for ionization that I'm going to show is the a molecular calculation where we did electron impact ionization of the H2 molecule. We actually did the hydrogen molecular ion first and then H2, but the agreement between the solids or the squares here and the measurement was pretty good. And angular distributions that were measured by several groups now are also in good agreement with these calculations. So one can look at simple molecules as well as simple atoms using a time dependent approach. Although I should say that the computational resources needed to do molecules are several orders of magnitude larger than they are for atoms, based on the way we set the problem up. I'll not talk about excitation too much, except to say that the time-dependent close coupling method is only really suited to look at excitation cross-section from one electron systems, and that's because of the configuration average nature of our, of our approach. One can then look at the configuration to configuration for one electron systems, where of course the configuration and terms coincide. And we can look at lithium and beryllium plus, and again, time-dependent methods, our matrix methods, and converging close coupling all agree quite well for these type of systems. So I'd like to make a few conclusions about our ionization data that we've, that we've, uh, we've computed over the last decade or so. Stuart and Connor led a, a study where they looked at how this, these improved close coupling calculations actually make a difference in plasma transport. What they did was that they said, Let's look at the generalized rate coefficients that people use in plasma transport codes. And we'll put in the best possible data for, say, hydrogen and helium. And then we'll do the same with the sort of wave calculations, put that into the plasma transport codes, or even a semi-classical approach, and how well approaches such as the sort of wave might work. And that would be useful to assess the uncertainty then when you don't do close coupling methods for something like iron or tungsten or something like that. And it was an interesting study. And what they found was that the distorted wave approach was closer, in some senses, to the close coupling answer for ions, but a semi-classical approach was actually uh, preferred for the neutral systems. Now, all these data that we talked about have been archived in the ADAS database, and they're actually, I think, also available through the IAEA's website as well, at least most of it. And there's been a series of data papers that have studied all the, the general, or that have published all the generalized collision irradiative cross-sections or rate coefficients for hydrogen all the way up to carbon, and nitrogen, I think, or carbon and nitrogen, I think, are, are in the works. But in terms of the uncertainty, I'd like to sort of draw uh, a distinction between three groups that I think are important to consider. Neutral atoms, excited states, and then multiply charged ions. Neutral atoms, the time-dependent method is pretty good for one and two electron uh, systems. It performs well, and there's good agreement with measurements. For cases where the measurement doesn't agree well, you can make a persuasive arguments. I think that the measurement is the thing that needs to be looked at again because two or three methods come together that agree well. The start of wave approaches, which of course are much computationally easier to run, tend to overestimate the total cross section by about 20 percent or 50 percent, depending on exactly the target and the configuration. But our time dependent method is much more difficult to apply and is probably uh, less accurate for systems in which the term dependence is exhibited in the initial state. For neutrals, or for excited states of such systems, uh, the time-dependent method should be of comparable accuracy, but the calculations can be much more difficult. 
in terms of just slower conversion properties, the numerics can be much more painful. You might need a uh, much larger radial mesh extent. The partial wave expansion, the partial wave conversions can be quite slower as well. But calculations that are performed to completeness should be should be quite accurate. And importantly, distorted wave methods are less accurate for the excited states of such uh, neutral systems. But then you come to multiply charged ions. Distorted wave approaches relatively become more accurate as the charge in the ion increases. And so there's probably less need for close coupling approaches when the nuclear charge dominates. And this is uh, hand wavingly true for ions that are maybe more than twice or three times ionized. But if excited states are important, uh, you really want to check such assumptions if possible. And some broader conclusions is that experiment is usually taken by, the, by our theoretical community as the ultimate arbiter to distinguish between theories. But in some cases, there's evidence that uh, these measurements need to be looked at again. And so I'd make a plea, perhaps this is not to the right community, but for these measurements to be, to be looked at again, because it's only, I think you can only have high confidence in the data set where you've got several calculations and several measurements that either agree or that you understand the differences between them. And unfortunately, though, in today's funding uh, scenarios, I think this wish may be unrealistic, but that's something we can perhaps take to the AEA, that they can maybe use their influence perhaps to push funding agencies or not. But that's, I think, uh, an important issue for us theorists as well. If we can't trust the measurements for some of these things, uh, that makes our job more difficult. The other issue that, as uh, I'm sure you've noticed, I've completely ignored so far, basically, any heavy elements. And tungsten, of course, is the gorilla in the room in terms of heater and fusion modeling. The transition metals such as iron and its neighbors are often the key to understanding astrophysical plasmas. But close coupling calculations are few and far between for these things, particularly for ionization. Uh, unfortunately, I think that a TDCC method is unlikely to be applied for the near neutral ions of tungsten. Our matrix calculations are probably the most likely close coupling method that can be applied, but these calculations are very large and consume a lot of resources, so getting uncertainty on them may be difficult. However, all is not lost. If you get uh, tungsten stripped by several ions, distorted wave approaches to ionization should be reasonably accurate. Whether this, stop, whether this becomes accurate depends on what you mean by accurate and what uh, ion stage you're actually looking at too. So in a path forward way, uh, a benchmark study might be a useful approach for this community to actually put some uh, numbers on the uncertainty. Ionization cross-sections are what time-dependent methods can probably contribute best to, and however, of the ions that are probably of most interest, they may be out of reach from TDCC methods. So a lower Z or neutral ion, a lower Z neutral atom or a low charged ion might be the most viable candidate, such as the ones that I've talked about so far. <coughs> so 